Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this very special National Science Week event with us here at the Australian Space Agency. Let me first introduce myself. My name is Keegan Buzzer, and I'm the Director of Communications at the Australian Space Agency. And it is a great pleasure to have you here today for this special in conversation event with Australia's astronaut in training, Catherine Bennell Pegg. I'd like to begin today's event by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands, the many lands on which we meet today, noting that this is a virtual event. I am on the land of the Minjin people in Brisbane. Catherine joins us from Germany. I will keep this brief because I know you're not here to see me. You're all here to see Catherine and to hear her tremendous story. Um, to let you know a little bit about today's proceedings, we'll soon hear from Catherine, who will um, take us through a day in the life of her as an astronaut in training in Germany with the European Space Agency. Catherine will also tell us a little bit about her incredible background, her journey to this uh, marvellous historic point in her career, as well as some advice for you. But the other terrific part about today is the Q&A session that will take place after. I have a few questions, of course, but we are really keen for you to contribute your questions today and to get as many of those through to Catherine for her to answer. So if you do have a question, uh, please use the Q&A function here on Teams. You'll see there's a Q&A box uh, on the screen that you're able to submit your questions and they will come through to, to me and Catherine and uh, we'll be able to get to as many as we possibly can. So folks, as I mentioned, Catherine Bennell Pegg is a true trailblazer. Uh, she happens to be a colleague of mine at the Australian Space Agency, but at the moment she is making history in Germany as the first ever person to be trained as an astronaut under the Australian flag. So without further ado, I'll pass to Catherine and let her tell you all about her incredible story. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Keegan. And hi to everyone who's joined us online as well. It's so great to be talking with you. I understand many of you have dialed in from your school right now. And I'm actually dialing in from my school too, uh, the European Astronaut Centre here in Germany, where I'm doing basic astronaut training. It's a school for astronaut candidates or ASCANs like me who have just been selected. And when we graduate next year, we can call ourselves astronauts and we'll be ready to be picked for missions to the International Space Station or even beyond. And so today I'm really excited to chat with you about why we explore, first of all, my journey to become an ASCAN, what we're doing on the training and how you two can be involved. And I really look forward to your questions too. I'm sure some of you will stump me. Uh, challenge is on. Um, but first of all, why do we explore? Well, we recently celebrated 50 years since humans first explored another world in situ, our moon, where three people sat atop what was then the tallest, most powerful rocket called the Saturn V. A few seconds after the rocket roared into life, astronauts were jolted hard back into their seats and then soon reached a speed 11 times faster than a bullet. They soared to the moon, not completely sure whether their lander would survive touchdown. And when it did, they were the first humans to land on another world. They donned their spacesuits, opened the hatch and stepped out into the bright sunlight on the moon with the stars above them, silver dust at their feet and the earth in the sky. And they put human footprints on another world for the first time. What an incredible feat. Imagine that effort 50 years ago in a world that did not yet have the internet or even Instagram. 3D printers or even post-it notes, desktop computers or even calculators. After landing on the moon six times, human space exploration has not stopped. Humans have continued to explore space, but closer to home, in low Earth orbit. The space shuttle flew over 135 times, servicing satellites like the Hubble Space Telescope and putting them up there and then ultimately constructing the huge International Space Station that is the main home in space for astronauts today. Seven crew are on board up there right now. In fact, there's been crew on it continuously for over 20 years, more than many of your lifetimes. You can sometimes see the ISS in the night sky above Australia, bright and moving fast. See if you can spot it. It might be that an astronaut is looking right back at you. 
And this International Space Station, or ISS, as it's referred to, is an incredible place. Laid out, it's larger than a football pitch, and the inside has the volume of a 747 aircraft. It's full of labs. It's one of the largest collaborations in the history of science and a shining example of international cooperation. It's a place for science, tech demos, for helping Earth and to prepare for the future of human exploration on the moon and even one day to Mars. But why are we doing all this? What motivates humans to explore throughout history and to continue to invest our resources into such endeavors? Why explore at all? I think we can answer in two parts. Firstly, tangible, and secondly, emotional. The tangible reasons are the discoveries we make up there to improve life on Earth. Pure and applied sciences, including medicine, materials, fluid sciences, the new tech we can develop. Space explorations helped us make inventions like chips in the cameras in your phones, invisible braces, wireless headphones, the list goes on. It's helped progress the development of solar energy, of MRI machines, of cordless drills. And today there are even economic opportunities for entrepreneurs to play in space. It's helped us create the tech and capabilities that have meant we can build the satellites that we use today to improve life on, life on Earth, like GPS and Earth observation. And all these things are important and they make space exploration more sustainable. But I don't think that on their own, they fully capture why. When we explore, we find mysteries. We see things we don't yet understand. In solving mysteries, we create new technologies and we build new knowledge that can be used in ways we cannot even imagine. But it's even more than that. Part of the reason we explore, I think, is a feeling. It's that feeling you get when you look at the stars, at a big mountain, at the vast ocean. It's the awe of looking at pictures of the Curiosity rover on Mars. It's that urge you feel to look under that rock, to climb that tree. When you're bursting to, uh, bursting to ask a question about why things are the way they are. And we feel this because we at our core are explorers. Humans seek a higher purpose, a greater understanding of the world and to contribute a legacy. It is this that inspires us when young to have the dreams that guide our lives. There are lots of things to explore, but my dream has always been to explore outer space. When I was in primary school, at night, I used to lay on the grass in the backyard with some old binoculars and look up at the stars. I could see the detail on the moon, it would suddenly become clear. Some months I could even see the Andromeda galaxy, which is a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. That's a galaxy with over one trillion stars, many of which likely have planets too. How amazing is that? And there's over 200 billion galaxies in the universe. There's so much out there that remains to be discovered. And I really wanted to be an astronaut for the adventure of it and the discoveries I could help make doing so. But becoming an astronaut is not something that is clear how to reach. It's not something you can reach in a linear career path. Almost anyone in STEM, science, technology, engineering or maths professions can be eligible. And there's no university program or astronaut subject at school, right? There might be just a couple of chances to apply in your lifetime to be an astronaut, if you're lucky. So what I did was make sure I was ready if the chance to apply ever came. So I decided to be a space engineer. An engineer helps many different scientists to make their discoveries in space. But when I finished university, Australia didn't have a space agency and it never had a call for astronauts. So after my undergraduate courses, I went overseas. And there I fell in love with a space engineering career in its own right. I had the great experience to study and work across many countries on some of the most compelling space missions. I worked on lunar space station concepts, Mars robotic hoppers, robotic arm missions to catch dead satellites and drag them out of orbit, climate missions to look at the ocean and the atmosphere and a mission to help detect the gravity waves from black holes. I got to live above the polar circle and launch payloads on high altitude balloons under the aurora. I got to drop experiments in zero gravity drop towers. I developed augmented reality systems and graphene technologies and got to help make new mission profiles for the Orion vehicle that's soon to take people back to the moon. I really love the innovation and invention of being a space engineer and working with teams to solve important problems and make those new discoveries. Pinch me moments have included the thrill of watching a rocket launch with a payload I helped build. Crossing your fingers as you watch it roar into the sky. Floating weightless inside a zero-g plane. 
and creating together from the first spark of idea, a new part of the ISS that's operating up there now. And when the Australian Space Agency was set up, I was attracted home and have had a great time working with the team of space agents there. We've helped develop new space programs together and mission concepts, including the Trailblazer rover that's heading to the moon. But two years ago, my WhatsApp chats with all my friends lit up. The European Space Agency was going to select new astronauts for the first time in over a decade. I was eligible as I was British. I'd finally got my chance to apply. And the selection process was such an adventure. The first step was to see the criteria. And this is always something that you look for because the criteria for being an astronaut has been evolving over time as missions are now many months in space on the space station. It's no longer alpha profiles they look for. Well, you needed a master's degree in a STEM field with a PhD or a second master's in an additional STEM field, a bonus. You needed expeditionary skills, which means working out in the field, mostly with teams in difficult environments like Antarctica or military deployments or on ships in the ocean or remote aid work for more than six weeks continuous. And that's because when you're in space, it's an expedition and all those team skills are incredibly important. You needed operational skills. Examples are things like manufacturing, lab work, flying, being a surgeon, and hobbies like scuba diving, skydiving, flying, emergency service volunteering, basically working well in a procedure-based environment under pressure. They were looking for international experience because in space and on Earth, you're working with international crews and need to be tolerant to different types of cultures and ways of work. Foreign languages were ideal for the same reason as international experience, but also because some parts of the ISS are in Russian. You also needed to be medically healthy and physically fit. No small list, but I was so relieved to meet the criteria and I applied along with about 23,000 other hopefuls for just five career spots. And that sounds like pretty tough odds, right? But actually the population of Europe is well over 400 million. So the biggest down select was the number of people that didn't click the apply button. It's so important to throw your hat in the ring if you want a chance. There were six knockout rounds in the selection, each of which involved tense waiting to see if I got through with emails coming in at about 3 a.m. each time and quick trips to Europe and back for the assessments. Tests involve IQ, coordination like flight simulators, essays, psychology tests, medical uh, screening and technical interviews. There are impromptu speeches, questions like, what would you do if there was an emergency on the space station, like a choose your own adventure? There were quick switches and in interviews to foreign languages you claim to know. There were stress tests in teams. It was just like the movies. And importantly, what I learned during the process was that astronaut selectors aren't looking for heroes or geniuses. Rather, they seek people who are good enough across a lot of different topics. In most tests, your overall score didn't actually matter as long as you passed every single one of the many tests. So what you can take away from that is that excellence is not the same as perfection. Astronauts really have to be well-rounded all-rounders. In the end, after a year and a half, I passed all the rounds. Uh, I was amazed and ultimately was selected to represent Australia the best possible outcome. So I'm now here in Germany training to be an astronaut together with the five European career astronauts. And those other five in my class really do all come from different STEM fields. They include a paratrooping medical doctor, an astronomer with experience in the Naval Reserves, a military helicopter test pilot, a neuroscientist who is also a biomechanical engineer and flies hot air balloons, and another aerospace engineer. Other astronauts in the core include volcanologists, material scientists, and Antarctic explorers. They are some of the best team players and most humble people I know. At the beginning of the selection, none of us really thought we'd be the one to make it, but we all gave it our absolute best go. And while it may seem we've all now ticked our dream off, this is actually just the start of our astronaut journeys, a beautiful journey for each of us and each of us together as well. And the start of any astronaut's career journey is called Astronaut Candidate Basic Training. This runs for about one to two years, and it's what I'm doing right now at the European Astronaut Centre or EAC. So let's have a quick look at that. 
It really is just like going to school, except this school has full-size models or mock-ups of parts of the space station to train on as your classrooms. It's got control rooms where we can talk to astronauts on the space station. It's got virtual reality and augmented reality labs, a gym, science labs, a pool with ISS mock-ups in it. There are facilities where astronauts stay after their flights, people do bed rest studies, pressure chambers, centrifuges and others. We do have a normal classroom and our own desks and we have so many subjects to cover. So each day I get up before dawn and cycle to the astronaut center and have a full day jam packed with practical seat and theoretical classes and sometimes trips away as well. So right now we are one third into our training and the class and I have become quite a tight, tight team and we've already learned so much. We've learned about the science you can do in space how to install and operate scientific experiments. And this is because as astronauts, we're the eyes, the hands, the ears of scientists on the ground who have developed them for years, sometimes decades for their experiments to go to space. And the reason there's so many experiments is that because in space, we don't feel gravity anymore. All of life on earth has developed with gravity. It's the one constant factor. So without it, cells behave differently. Materials don't clump. Fluids and fires move differently without an up or down for convection. So there's research into different diseases like Parkinson's by looking at protein growth, development of less carbon emitting cement, looking at how we can have stem cell treatments because stem cells don't clump so grow faster up there. And we can look at fluids to better understand lava flows and their effect on climate. And so as astronauts, to learn all this, we do both classroom lessons and lab work in biology, material, physics, astronomy, and more. We also study medicine because we have to be ready to help our teammates if something goes wrong up there. We learn how to give needles. We've learned how to draw blood and stitch. We also learn this to do experiments on each other. And that's because in space, bodies change so much. The human body is the ultimate adapter. In space, without feeling gravity, you don't need strong muscles and bones, so your body gets weaker. There's no gravity pulling your blood to your feet, so your face falls up. In space, without gravity, your body grows taller, sometimes 10 to 12 centimeters taller. And for some reason, we need less sleep, only about six hours. So to make sure we can be okay when we return to Earth again, we also have to exercise a lot in space to keep our muscles and bones healthy enough to handle the landing and life afterwards. You do about two hours in the gym on the space station a day and also here on Earth during training. So we know how to do those exercises before we get up there. We learn about nutrition and how astronauts are also great test subjects for all the diseases on Earth that deal with those issues because they basically um, progress the deterioration in fast forward compared to most conditions on Earth. Our classroom, the classroom lessons for medicine actually used an augmented reality system on HoloLens where you could zoom in on the body and walk through organs to try and understand them better. We've been learning about how to do spacewalks by scuba diving in a deep pool. And that's because spacewalks are so important to go outside the space station or space vehicle and fix and install new experiments like telescopes on the outside or new solar panels. But, you know, there's nothing quite like a spacewalk on Earth, except to go underwater. And you know, in space, even though you feel weightless, there's still inertia. When you start moving something that's many tons, you have to stop it. So you learn how to handle that. You learn tips like not looking down too early when you step out of the hatch, because a lot of astronauts get vertigo and uh, sort of a panic when they look down at Earth and feel like they might fall. You, look, you work in buddy systems, just like scuba diving. And there's a lot of training on the tools to use and the tethers so you don't fly away. We've done a lot of expeditions. Uh, we've done ocean survival and fire uh, to see fire management to see how our bodies uh, handle those environments in a team situation. We've done low pressure and hypoxia training to see how we can detect from our body symptoms if there's a pressure leak. And we might get to practice being in zero G with a parabolic flight. And so this expedition is all especially important. We've got winter coming up as well because astronauts are just a visible part of a huge team on the ground. Each astronaut mission involves thousands of people, mission control, the scientists, the medical doctors, the engineers, and many more. Also in space, astronauts work in highly performing teams. So there's a lot of emphasis on human behavior and performance and psychology as well. Followership, actively empowering and supporting the leaders 
and stepping up when it's your turn to lead in a, the right situation, knowing how to do that well are incredibly important. There's expeditions that to hone these skills in a team building. Also, because astronauts are ambassadors for space, we've been learning about other space agencies doing media training. And there's also topics you might not expect. Photography, for example, to create inspirational art, document experiences, and take photos from space of all the phenomenon happening below you on Earth. We're also learning languages. And next up, I'm really looking forward to learning how to fly the space station robotic arm and about all the systems of the space station. We do a lot of that using virtual reality and just yesterday got scanned for our avatars. Next month, we'll go on a centrifuge as well and see how we handle the high G forces. A lot of the next steps in the training though are also about things that are normal life on Earth, but they're not that normal in space. How to brush your teeth and hair, how you cut your nails without them flying around and landing in someone's eye. Most missions at the moment are to the International Space Station for six months, but some are as short as two weeks and some as long as a year. We've learned that for your mission that you usually get to choose your favorite songs to play while you're listening in the rocket on the launch pad. When you first get to microgravity, you have the urge to kick or swim and it's hard to be still instead of bouncing off the walls. But it's really important you don't do that because you could kick someone in the face. In space, it's really easy to spot the rookie astronaut. You spend most of the first week probably vomiting and try not to turn your head too fast. If you throw something, it goes in a straight line, not an arc, so you become hopeless at catching it and have to adapt. It goes the other way around too when you come back to Earth. See if an astronaut can catch a ball after they come back home. They can't. It's very embarrassing for them. After two weeks in space, you're usually well adapted and can start a more typical routine. Um, astronauts get to have phone calls home. There's movie nights up there usually once a week. However, despite all the exercise, two hours a day, you actually can't shower or have a bath or wash your clothes. And all water is recycled. So yesterday's glass of water is today's glass of water if you know what I mean. Once my basic training is completed, I'll bring the knowledge home to help accelerate the opportunities for all Australians like you to be more involved in human space flights. Also for our scientists, our engineers and more, because wouldn't it be great to see Australians more involved in this exciting field? While I may end up being the first Australian astronaut, I don't plan on being the last. Once, if I'm one day selected for a mission, there'll usually be two more years of pre-mission training. Being an astronaut, you really are back to school for many years. And you know, it's such an exciting time to be an astronaut. Humans are on the cusp of the next great space exploration endeavor. Around the world, countries are preparing human space flight plans with unprecedented ambition. There's going to be new space stations, both close to the Earth in low Earth orbit, like the ISS, and also out near the moon. Because we're going back to the moon or forward to the moon, as they say, but this time it's to stay for the incredible science to demonstrate what like-minded nations can do together and build the technology partnerships of the future to help solve other grand challenges. We have so much to learn from each other. And Australia is part of this team of what's called the Artemis Nations. We've got skills to offer. We've got missions going up. There's a small rover in development in Australia right now called the Trailblazer mission. And there's other missions as well under our Moon to Mars initiative looking at seismic activity on the moon or providing navigation systems for the moon. But Artemis isn't just about going to the moon. It's about the first step towards Mars. It's often said that the first person to walk on, the, on Mars is sitting in a classroom right now. Well, maybe that person is in your class. Maybe it's you. I encourage you to dream big, no matter your dream. Having a dream is really a joy and it's so powerful. I spoke at the beginning how 50 years ago, people first work, walked on the moon. In 50 years from now, when many of you in school today will still be in the workforce, how can you imagine all the possibilities for what your jobs and lives can be? Well, you can dream about the kind of person you'll be, that is your values, and the problems you want to help solve, your purpose. And then you can write your own story, create your own path to do that without limit on your imagination or the boldness of your dream. Thank you for joining us.
Catherine, thank you so much for taking us through all of that. You always blow my mind when you start talking about all the things that that you have done and that you continue to do. Um, I'm going to get straight into questions because we've already had 100 questions come in in the time wow. um, that you've been speaking. Um, before I get to the questions that have come through, though, one of the things that I'm really interested in, and you, you kind of touched on it a little bit there at the end, is that piece of advice that you would have for particularly the students who are joining us online today. We've got nearly 5,000 students joining from across Australia. Um, what would your message be to them, not just for the kids that maybe want to become an astronaut, but for, for all kids as they look to their futures? Thanks, Keegan. And wow, 5,000. I'm so excited to be talking to all of you. Well, I'd say first for those that want to be an astronaut, find out what you're passionate about in any STEM field and make a career out of it. It can be hard to figure out what it is you love, but that's part of the fun of the journey. It's not a black and white process. It involves trial and error, but you won't learn unless you give things a go, right? And a career in something you love to do both day to day, but also in kind of that higher reason for what your field is moving towards can set you up for a satisfying career and really just to be a happy person as well. And for those that want to be an astronaut, the wonderful thing is that there's so many backup options. And when you found what you love, do something in that field that pushes you, that maybe scares you a little bit, that you think is just beyond your reach. Don't worry about trying to be the smartest in the room either. I think when I was younger, particularly straight out of uni, I was always intimidated by the brains around me. But the reality is we all bring unique perspectives and there's many ways to come to a solution. Sometimes the most inexperienced person can be the most novel. Uh, to be an astronaut, you've also got to work on your character. I talked about expeditionary skills, how you contribute to teams. Get outside your comfort zone and understand how you react and work on that. You can't sit on the couch playing video games all day to do that either. Um, and of course, study hard, right? The better you do and the more you understand, the more doors open for you. For those that like space, you can get involved now. Um, you can grab your binoculars and look at the sky. You can tinker with electronics. For kids in like junior school and early high school, I'm really excited. Like I can actually let you know that you can take part in something called Mission X, train like an astronaut. This is a global challenge where you can do science and sports training alongside me in my class for the next six months or so. And uh, look out for more information on that coming soon. The challenge is going to open in September. There's also a lot of internships available now in the Australian sector for those at high school or at uni. There's so many opportunities out there. Yesterday, it was actually announced that five Indigenous Australians have been selected to go to NASA JPL for internships, which is amazing. Uh, for those of you that like space, but think an astronaut isn't for you, there are so many things in space. You can have almost any kind of career in a flight to space. A historian, you can be an artist, a space tradie, an entrepreneur. And um, yeah, no matter your dreams, whether it's space or not, dream big and enjoy it. Catherine, uh, the first question I'm going to take you to that's come through online is from Cristiano Brando. And the reason I picked this as the first one is because you are making history as the first person uh, to be trained as an astronaut under the Australian flag. And Cristiano asks, what unique challenges and experiences have you encountered that differ from your international counterparts? And how do you believe those experiences are shaping your perspectives on space exploration? Great, thank you, Cristiano. So um, I'd say I've had a number of different experiences, both early in my career and during the astronaut journey. Uh, during my career, my early career, I've had experiences like a lot of other Australians in the field, which is that until recently, you had to go overseas to have a career developing space missions for the most part, if you're Australian. So you had to go above and beyond in order to enter this field. Um, and you ended up seeing the world from an international view. Uh, coming back to Australia, I was amazed by all of the opportunity here as well. And you really, understand the difference between what it is to work in a, a mature um, established space sector versus one that's up and coming and exciting. And in Australia, um, there 
there's so much need for for good skills and you can bring those uh, special lessons to bear and that's something that having those foot in two worlds is not something that people from established space nations necessarily have during the astronaut journey i'd say what's a bit different is that for my classmates, they all have a flight guaranteed uh, to the International Space Station on a long duration mission sometime in the next eight years. Um, for me, that's that's not determined yet. That's a decision to be made for the future. But it's certainly very exciting. And, you know, the opportunities that come with being the first to represent Australia are also incredibly positive. I get to help shape the future of space exploration and opportunity for our country. And I'm really proud to do that. I know too, Catherine, you've been sharing the virtue of Vegemite with your, your colleagues as you train there at the um, at the Astronaut Centre. Um, the next question actually comes from one of our schools that joins us online. So Green Hills Primary School and Jess from Green Hills Primary School asks, what is your favourite part of astronaut training? You talked about a lot of the stuff you do. Uh, is there a favourite from the sort of first four or five months of your training? Oh, I'd have to say that my favorite thing so far is the underwater EVA training. I love scuba diving as a hobby and being under there, um, practicing to do spacewalks, you really feel like you're being part of a space mission. There is a mission control room that's set up like a mock space control room and you have to go through different challenges uh, underwater and doing that together as a team um, with the other classmates is really excellent. But, you know, I'm loving every day. Every day is different. It's never boring. It's a fantastic experience. Kind of disappointed you didn't say media training, Catherine. I would have thought that was your, your favourite part. Can't beat your media training, <laughs> Keegan. <laughs> um, the next question we, we've had come in, which says, G'day, Catherine. What training does the European Space <laughs> Agency provide for maintaining good psychological health in extended isolation? This person that's put in this question is actually deploying soon to Antarctica for 12 months. So interested to hear some strategies from you as an ASCAN. That's a really interesting element of it. It's not just the physical side, but the mental side. What do they do with you to try and um, support you with that? Yeah, first of all, congratulations on your deployment to Antarctica. How exciting and incredible. Um, there's a lot of parallels with Antarctica, right? It's remote, it's harsh, it's isolated. So there's a lot of joint research between Antarctica and space psychologists. So what we've learned about is something called human behaviour and performance, about developing the right team competencies, building teams efficiently quickly. Um, that's rotating through the storming, forming phases to get to a high performing team. You have to learn self care. Um, often, I think many of us push ourselves too hard without looking at the bigger picture that it's a marathon, not a sprint when we're on expeditions like these. It's really important to have humility and, and have kindness and tolerance to those around you so that small issues don't become big ones. And keep that connection with the outside world. In space, we can have phone calls every every day. We can have video calls with family once a week. We have um, psychology tag ups with a psychologist one on one that are completely confidential, unless um, we ask them not to be. And they're usually, I think, every fortnight. So psychological health is so important because you can't perform without it. And um, being in a team where you're all are bonded and open to share issues you may have is the only way to have a successful mission that's lower risk than otherwise. The most dangerous thing to do is to not have relationships that are trustful or have psychological safety. So focusing on building that camaraderie in the team in the same way you do in sports and things like that is critical. The next question as well is from one of our schools joining us online, Taylor Primary School. The year five and six classes are sent through a question which I think all of us that are a bit earthbound probably think about, which is, is it scary for you thinking about space and, and maybe going to space in the near future? Hi, Taylor Primary School. Thanks for the question. Um, mostly I'm just excited, right? I've been a space engineer in the field from my whole career, all my studies. And so I understand pretty well that Everyone that's working on space missions is really highly trained and really passionate about what they do and there's great quality standards. That being said, right, it's still a frontier. We're still often at the edge of technology, so there is risk involved. Um, 
so you have to go into it with eyes wide open. Um, in terms of our training, we train for every kind of possibility that you can imagine. But space still surprises us. So we have to have the right skills in place to be able to handle any situation. So to remain calm under pressure, to keep your thoughts clear and to have the tools in your pocket to know when to escalate something as a dangerous issue or just to deal with it as a status quo. So, you know, I think sitting on the launch pad, um, every astronaut's going to be a little bit nervous approaching that moment. Uh, we're all human. But in the moment, you're so busy and engaged and ticking off your checklist and ready to go to space that I don't think there'll be time for fear. Catherine, you mentioned during your um, your first section of today's event, you sort of talked about your career and the fact that, that you had to leave Australia um, to, to start your career in space, but uh, you were lured back with the establishment of the Australian Space Agency and 12 year old Levi asked the question, when did you join the ASA and how did that come about? Thanks Levi. I joined the Australian Space Agency when it was just over a year old. So the Australian Space Agency was set up in 2018, so it's five years old now. And um, they started hiring uh, technical management under the CTO. And the CTO put out a call for, for people with space engineering experience. And I was on maternity leave with my second kid working on uh, space station missions. Um, before that, a new part of the space station. And I saw that they were hiring and I thought, wow, wouldn't it be amazing to be able to go home? I never thought I'd have the possibility to do that. And I thought, well, that job's probably a bit beyond me. They, they probably need someone towards the end of their career. I only had 10 years experience, um, but I applied. And so did my husband, who was also a space engineer. And um, we were both hired home. And that was the start of a great journey, uh, getting to use our expertise to help grow the opportunities and capabilities here in Australia. And what I learned when I came back was that there are so many opportunities in Australia from adjacent fields spinning in, as well as from the space industry itself. Catherine, uh, our next question comes to us from some students uh, at Clare High School and what they have asked about is the fact that the overview effect, so um, perhaps get you to explain the overview effect for those who, who don't know it to start with with this question, but Nathaniel from the high school asked, do you think that the overview effect will help you to understand yourself? Can anyone ever really fully understand themselves? Well, I think we try. I definitely, love to experience the overview effect. And for those that might not have heard of that before, that refers to the, the sense of awe, I think would be the best emotion, um, being struck kind of silent by looking back at the Earth from space. So when astronauts first went to space, they described this, looking back at the Earth um, and, you know, seeing the thin blue line of atmosphere around our world. And that's, you know, where all of humans have ever developed, where all of our seven billion friends are, are living and working and seeing out their evolution. And they're struck by the fact that they can't see borders between countries, by the fact they can see how fragile our world is and that we're one humanity. And many are inspired when they come back to contribute to building understanding of our world and to protecting it and to nurturing it. And I think it gives a lot of astronauts a different perspective on, you know, don't sweat the small stuff and how important it is to communicate that message about conserving the earth and um, helping humanity develop in a positive way. You hear um, of some people, some astronauts have even become politicians afterwards in order to, to spread that message. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Catherine, I'm going to take us from that, that really deep question that you've just um, answered for us to something on the perhaps less deep but no less interesting side because I think there's at least a dozen variations of this question and it's a question that astronauts I think get all the time or astronauts in training. How do you go to the toilet in space, Catherine? 
Well, you're able to, which is good. And it's not always in nappies. That's only sometimes. Um, so on the space station, um, there's a couple of toilets with another one looking to be installed. Um, the toilets are really highly technical. Um, they're very, very um, special pieces of engineering and don't look much like Earth toilets. So like the kind of toilet bowl where you do your number twos is quite small because you don't need to sit on it and it's got leg straps to hold you down so you don't flow away. And there's airflow to make sure everything goes where it's meant to. Um, for number ones, there's like a funnel for both men and women, and that goes to a separate system because water is extracted, because water has to be recycled in space. And actually, the history of space toilet development is quite interesting. Um, everything that goes to space has to be rigorously tested, right, with requirements. How do you test a space toilet? Well, they fill zero G flights with a series of different models and have volunteers test them out in parabolas that are 20 seconds zero G at a time or not, um, which is quite remarkable actually. And early in the space station's development, the space station almost had to be abandoned when one of the toilets stopped working and they thought they're gonna be without a toilet for longer than uh, and the astronauts could could handle using bags and nappies and things like that. But yeah, fortunately, uh, there's a there's a fair bit of research that goes into keeping astronauts healthy and hygienic in space longer term. That's good to know. Um, uh, a next question, um, and again, this is a question that we've had a couple of variations of, which you mentioned. So at the end of this uh, training process, you'll be a fully qualified astronaut who will be able to go to the International Space Station. If you were to go to the International Space Station, you'll pick for a mission. How long would you sort of generally go into space for and, and spend up there? And what sort of things would you do whilst you're up there? Well, there's lots of different types of missions to the International Space Station and ultimately it depends on what your country is interested in doing up there, what kind of science um, should be done and what kind of um, parallel program and exploration a country wants to have in order to um, contribute a system to cover the cost of that flight, which is the usual model. Um, in a two week mission, there's usually a lot of experiments done very rapidly. Um, and a lot of the time is also spent adapting to weightlessness. So it's very intense um, and there's very little time to really settle into things like having your own sleeping quarters, your own sleeping bag, sleeping in the middle of the modules and stuff like that. It's like camping. On a six month mission, it's longer duration and there's the opportunity for you to be a lot more of a medical guinea pig um, for your country's doctors um, so that they can look at the effects of, you know, bone loss and muscle health and things and eye um, pressure because your eye vision also deteriorates in space probably due to that and all sorts of activities in that way. On a six month mission, you often also have more responsibilities like operating the Canada Arm or a spacewalk. And if astronauts are so lucky as to get a second mission, they can uh, apply to be commander of the space station as well. But, you know, there's also astronauts today that are going around the moon on uh, missions on Artemis. So that's another exciting destination that um, a lot of experienced astronauts are very excited about as well. And the longest time um, people are usually on the space station is about a year, but that's usually for very special long duration studies with that specific goal in mind to look at the effects on psychology and health for, for that kind of length. Catherine, you mentioned um, in your speech that you're a, you're a mum of two and, and you're married. And this next question comes from one of the year 11 students at Brentwood Secondary College who asked how you manage that, how you manage the training, um, being a parent, your personal life, all of those things at the same time. Yeah, that's a question I get asked a fair bit, actually, and I don't think there's any kind of golden perfect solution that fits everybody. For me, um, you know, I am a very busy person. Um, I make sure I compartmentalise to keep space for the different parts of my life. It's, you know, giving time to my, my family is non-negotiable for me. Right from the beginning, um, my husband and I are bo have both been space engineers. We met at university. Um, it wasn't by design um, that it worked out this way, but it's been very helpful that we both had parallel careers. So we've been able to balance the family 
for the most part. This year's different. It's a new normal this year with intense uh, basic training. So my family's over here with me in Germany and my husband uh, take, is taking a sabbatical to support us in that. But, you know, it's a constant challenge that evolves, but you've just got to be strict with yourself and, and draw the line that, you know, you get a certain amount of hours sleep a night, that you, you see your kids at a certain time every evening that you're here and um, let other people know your boundaries too. And then they usually respect them. It's terrific advice and, and advice that can be applied uh, across anyone's future and, and careers. Catherine, another question that's um, a bit of a consistent theme of the few hundred questions that we've had come through so far, which is sort of how you got to this point. And, and one of those questions, not so much about what you did at school and those really sort of practical things have you studied this or you did that what were those extracurricular activities that you did whilst you're at school and a young person to sort of set you up for this moment as becoming Australia's astronaut in training I think I was pretty fortunate that um I happen to really like all of the things that help prepare you to be a good astronaut without even knowing what they were so Basically, like I said, I wanted to be an astronaut ever since I was really young, primary school. And then in year eight at my careers counselling session, I said to my teacher and my parents, hey, I'd like to be an astronaut. And that's kind of it. And so I set off on the path to figure out what that would mean. And, you know, at the top level, it looked like scientist, pilot, engineer were the options. Um, and I tried out all those things and I loved all of them. But in parallel, I was doing a lot of extracurricular. I was doing lots of different sports, basketball, tennis, netball. I was doing Duke of Edinburgh, band, debating, drama and music. And all of those things, I think, were just as important and powerful in setting me up to be the right kind of person um, to be on astronaut training. All of those soft skills are as important as the hard skills and doing your job. Later, when I was at university, um, I joined the Army Reserves, which was a fan fantastic formative experience to, to learn how to perform in expeditionary environments and how to lead and how to follow. I was in the New South Wales State Emergency Services, um, which taught me, you know, what space can do for a society, but also how to help people in need and manage um, difficult situations. Um, I was in, um, I went to India with Engineers Without Borders and learned about how to help communities over there and live in, you know, less developed societies and support them. So all of these different experiences were really, really helpful. More recently, I've done things um, like flying, which I also did as a teenager, scuba diving, a bit of skydiving. Um, I fly UAVs for Surf Life Saving Australia. And, you know, you can pick different parts of all of these that are helpful in my current job because yeah, being an astronaut involves so many diverse skill sets that having this diverse background is is great and helpful you know having hobbies is important for your psycholo psychological wellness in space you might have seen chris hadfield play the guitar up there other astronauts play um, music instruments too some people so so yeah don't just focus on the academics you need to be a more well-rounded person than just that I think an observation there too, Catherine, is that so much of, of that extracurricular stuff has had a team element and a, a sense of giving back, which is such an important message that I think you've been getting across today that, you know, there is so much excellence and brilliance in, in astronauts, but it's actually about uh, how you can be a team player. I've got a bit of a left field one for you again here, Kalanga State School. Never thought about this before. What happens when a body part is itchy in your spacesuit? Well, I, hmm, it would be very inconvenient. So in your spacesuit, you can't pull your hand in to scratch your face, right? So um, I understand that inside the helmet, there's some kind of, I don't know what it is exactly, but some kind of device you can kind of rub your face on a bit if it's itchy. There's a straw you can drink from and stuff like that. But yeah, I guess to a degree, you might, if it's your arm, you might try and rub it against uh, the, the outer shell of the spacesuit or something like that. But You've probably just got to deal with it. Um, you know, there's the spacewalks are pretty tough. A lot of astronauts come back with black fingernails from the pressure in their fingertips because you're sort of like inside a, a stiff balloon when you're in zero gravity. And, you know, there's been unfortunate cases where astronauts have got water leaks in their helmet that have been quite dangerous and they can't they can't really get their hand in there to shake it off. So yeah, it 
that would be tough. I don't like, you know, having a multi I can't scratch or something like that. <laughs> Get some stingos. Catherine, we've actually got um, the year five class from your old school on the line, which is is super cool. And they've just sent through a question. So uh, the year five um, students at your old school would like to know what have you found most challenging so far about space training and training to become an astronaut? Oh, amazing to have you online. Thanks so much for joining. What's been the most challenging? Well, a couple of things I'd say for me. Um, in terms of topics, one of my weaknesses would be basically I'm not that great at foreign languages. It's something that I've uh, always struggled with and I have to get confident in foreign languages really, really fast, right? So I'm just going to have to put in the extra effort for that, um, starting with learning English grammar even better. Um, also, you know, transitioning to becoming more of a public figure is something different from being a space engineer. I've had to learn how to get along with social media. Lucky I have some, I have some support with that. But I had to get Twitter and Instagram. I only had Facebook and LinkedIn like a cave woman because, uh, you know, outreach is really important and I want to share this exciting journey with all of you. Otherwise, you know, it's really intense and that's tough in terms of, you know, making sure you balance yourself and get the right amount of rest. That's probably the kind of overarching challenge, making sure that you don't burn yourself out on any particular topic so you've got the energy for the next day. Catherine, we've probably only got time for a few more questions. We're, we're starting to get toward the end of our time. Uh, Nellie has sent in a question and, and she's asked, have you had any negative experiences in the space field due to being a female? And I want to add on to that uh, a lot of what you've talked about in taking on this role and a big part of, of your mission is to inspire more women into STEM. Do you feel a lot of pressure to deliver against that objective? Oh, big questions and important ones too. Um, you know, throughout my career, I've mostly been in the minority as a woman and it's how I feel about that, I think has evolved over time and with my experiences. Um, one thing that struck me when I came home to Australia was how many amazing women there are in this field that I can take inspiration from, particularly in leadership positions. For example, my boss for the first time was a woman. I'd never had a female boss before. And I think that this gives us the opportunity to build the Australian space sector in a more diverse way than what I experienced overseas. Um, I think probably the hardest times for me personally were at university when, you know, young people might have a skewed view of how the world really is and think that because you're not someone that grew up coding and tinkering that you don't know what you're doing as an engineering student. That's not right at all. But usually most people, once they enter the field, realise that everyone's pretty capable that's there and puts the effort in. Um, in terms of being, you know, a role model to women, um, I mean, I, I hope to be a role model for for everyone else as well, but I recognise that STEM in Australia, women are in a minority. I think it's something like 27% are women. For astronauts, historically less than 10% have been women. And this is an issue not just because everyone should have, you know, the courage to dream and the ability to dream to be an astronaut, but because of astronauts being the basis for medical research in space, if you don't have many women up there, women on Earth don't benefit either. So, you know, I hope to help progress the conversation around um, women in space. Today, uh, we're seeing pr some progression in my astronaut class of six of us. Three of us are women, right? That's not because of affirmative action. That's based on merit. And there is no difference apart from some medical factors in how we're trained or our performance or anything like that. And I think that's important for people to know because in STEM fields, in many fields, we need diversity of thought to solve problems. We can't just pick the old stereotypes because that way we don't progress. So if you're um, from a diverse background out there, whatever that may be, know that you belong in fields that aren't necessarily traditionally for you. And in fact, you might even add more value to those fields, to those fields than the typical profiles. Two last questions. This one's a quick one. From Hadley, favourite piece of space-related fiction? Oh, wow. Um, I think I really liked The Martian. 
That was really good. I love that. Um, I really enjoyed how that was pretty pretty real. I also really like astronaut biographies. Uh, the Two Sides of the Moon was one that was great for understanding the space race better. Um, the uh, Riding Rockets is a hilarious one by US astronaut Michael Mullane. And there's many other movies and TV shows out there as well, um, if you like that kind of thing. As a movie, October Sky is pretty special. And The Dish. How could I forget the dish? Absolutely love the dish. Go watch it if you haven't already. Bit of a throwback. Okay, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Catherine and to thank all of you for joining us online today for this special National Science Week event. Catherine mentioned that she's now on social media, so really encourage you to, to go and find her and follow her on Instagram or LinkedIn or on Twitter. Um, I think it's now called X. Her handle is at Aussie Astro Cat. And you really will get to see all of the fantastic things that she's doing as she continues her training at the European Astronaut Centre in Germany. So with that, thank you again for joining us this very special National Science Week event. Enjoy the rest of Science Week and remember that so much of what you dream about is possible. And Catherine is such a fantastic example of that. Thanks so much to those of you that joined me for the webinar this morning. One of the questions that we didn't quite get to finish answering was why is space important in the context of other challenges around the world? Well, I think it is really important to consider space in the context of other challenges around the world. We know that today we're facing a climate crisis, mass extinctions, increasing rates of natural disasters like bushfires and floods and humanitarian issues. But space is not an alternative investment to this. Space actually is part of the solution. Space is critical, in fact, to helping support the solution of every single one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. And how does it do that? Well, space ultimately is just a place. It's an ultimate high point from which we can see phenomena around the world. And what you can see from up there, like our environment, our remote industries, people moving, you can connect and what you can connect like our remote communities you can inform and you can inform with information like position data that goes to your google maps or position data that helps precise farming or resource exploration in space it's an environment from which we can do fantastic microgravity sciences understanding better how fluids move or combustion behaves to inform new processes on Earth, or understand better about biology and food sciences and health solutions. It's a place from which we can explore and learn more about our world together with like-minded international partner nations where we can develop strong technological partnerships to help solve other challenges as well. But ultimately, space critically underpins society as well. If space was turned off, if we couldn't access our satellites, if they're all turned off today, societies we know it wouldn't function. You wouldn't be able to watch this video right now. You wouldn't be able to watch the Matildas game tomorrow night on TV, most likely. So if you want to help solve grand problems in this world, if you want to help develop new critical technologies that span industry, space is a wonderful field to be involved in.